Now, when you're dealing with complex health problems like kidney stones and gout, it's really important to break down the component parts of this problem and then look at those parts very, very closely because there's some interesting similarities and differences between gout and kidney stones. Uric acid uh, is involved in kidney stones as well as gout, but uric acid stones is not very common compared to the oxalate stones in the kidney. And so my question was, uh, is there any um, connection between oxalates okay, and gout? And there's definitely a huge connection. People who have high oxalates in their urine um, tend to have a worsening gout situation. You can even have, it's called pseudogout, which is kind of a, a gout that's not related to uric acid coming from oxalates, which is interesting. But uh, just like any problem, it's important to have as much information as possible. And I found a very uh, interesting paper uh, that was written in 1978 in this connection between oxalates and gout and kidney stones. So I'm gonna share with you some information because it can be very, very important in solving this mystery, especially if you are doing the ketogenic diet. Now I'm assuming that you already know that the most common type of kidney stone is calcium oxalate stones. And I'm also assuming that you know that some of the highest sources of uh, dietary oxalates come from spinach, rhubarb, almonds, chocolate, cacao, buckwheat, wheat, beans, soy, which includes tofu and miso, definitely includes the potato chip and the french fries, beet tops, a Swiss chard. Then we have star fruit as well. And out of all the berries, raspberry is highest in oxalates. Then we even have black pepper and black tea. Now, if you're uh, steeping the tea in some hot water for a very short period of time, let's say, for example, a minute versus seven minutes, there's going to be a huge variation in how much oxalates are in your tea. I mean, it can range between, you know, two milligrams of oxalates to up to like 65 milligrams if you're soaking this black tea in this water for like seven minutes. Almonds are very high in oxalates, but also you have the Brazil nut, hazelnut, cashews, and pine nuts. But just as a side note, if you're doing like coconut or peanuts or pistachios or macadamia nuts or walnuts, those are much lower. Another interesting point is if you're doing like massive amounts of ascorbic acid as a powder for some remedy, uh, like over four grams, which is quite large, that can actually increase your oxalate levels as well. The amino acid glycine, which a lot of people take that to help them sleep and to help various uh, health conditions, can also increase your risk of oxalates as well. And also if you have uh, problems with absorbing fats, like fat malabsorption, because you're low in bile, you can have more oxalates. And this is just another reason why bile is so important in your body to help you fully digest fats and also keep your oxalates to a minimum. But xylitol, which is a sugar alcohol, which is an alternative sweetener um, that I recommend a lot in the keto plan. If you're sensitive to kidney stones and gout, you should just try avoiding xylitol because apparently xylitol can really spike your oxalates. And just in nature, oxalates are formed in plants from non-oxidized saccharins, which are sugars. Maybe that's why the xylitol can also turn into oxalates. I'm not sure exactly. However, there's just an interesting connection between the consumption of xylitol and the worsening of kidney stones and gout for certain individuals, not everyone, but it's a real simple thing to avoid in your diet to see if you get better. You might be saying, well, I don't consume xylitol as a sweetener. Well, do you have sugar-free gum? It's loaded with xylitol. A lot of times toothpaste has xylitol and even mouthwashes have xylitol. I mean, it's just so interesting. If I look at myself now, my own health now versus in my 20s, I'm much healthier now. I'm 57 years old, almost 58 years old. I didn't even know the basics. It wasn't even on my radar until I started having problems later in my, well, my late 20s and my 30s. So a person can learn from their own experiences, which just takes a long time, or they can learn from other people's experiences. And that's what I'm trying to do with you. 
give you the experience of many other studies or people going through these things so you don't have to go through the mistakes that people made or spending years trying to figure stuff out. Now, there's another little interesting point about this topic related to gout. I always ask the question, like, why would someone develop gout as they get older? Like, after 40 years old or 45 or 50, all of a sudden they end up with gout. Why doesn't it happen earlier in life? Well, I found another uh, paper, which I'm going to put a link down below, which is actually very interesting. It's called ferrous oxalate. So in other words, if someone has too much ferritin, iron is stored in different forms in your body. Um, and ferritin is one form. It's like, I think 10 to 20% of your body stores iron in this ferritin, which is a type of protein. And so as your ferritin goes higher, this can cause it to bind with oxalates and aggravate gout symptoms and cause like arthritis in different parts of your body. You know, one thing that's interesting about iron is that it's, we have no mechanism to get rid of iron. So what happens as we age, if, especially if we're exposed to more iron, we can't get rid of it, especially in men, but also postmenopausal females too, because they're not menstruating and releasing this blood, which is releasing the iron. One big clue is that if you were to donate blood and you feel a lot better with your arthritis or your gout, then we need to suspect this could be the problem. So as we age, we may start noticing more of the problems with iron than when we were younger, especially since the more inflammation we have as we age, the more iron we tend to accumulate, more problems with their health, including gout. If that's your potential situation, well, you just need to work on getting rid of your inflammation, but also making sure that you reduce the amount of iron in the diet. And I'm talking about vitamin mineral products loaded with iron, okay? And you should not be taking those at all. And it's definitely the wrong type of iron. Another reason why you, some people might feel better if they consume less red meat could be this problem as well. On the ketogenic diet, it's not a high protein diet. It's a moderate protein diet. So red meat, uh, which is loaded in iron, and so is liver, um, could also be connected to this in certain people. So it's something to look at. Personally, my body does really good on red meat, but of course I'm not consuming massive amounts, uh, but I, I do very well. Some people don't. So this could be one of the reasons. So how can we neutralize this problem of oxalates? Okay, well, one thing you could do is make sure that your fluids that you consume every day are roughly between 2 to 2.5 liters. That is going to dilute this concentration of calcium oxalates uh, in your urine and prevent stones and also can decrease the intensity of gout pain. Number two, you want to start consuming calcium-rich foods, especially if you happen to be consuming foods high in oxalates. Unfortunately, Oxalates are in a lot of different foods, so it's almost impossible to completely eliminate them. But if you're having calcium or dairy with these vegetables, okay, you can reduce the amount of oxalates that are reabsorbed into the body because the calcium binds with oxalates in your intestine, and then that just goes right through you. It's not reabsorbed into the blood and then ending up in the kidneys or your urine. When you go to the hospital for kidney stones or someone goes to a clinic, uh, sometimes they're left with a little brochure and uh, usually it'll say, you know, things like, oh, avoid calcium rich foods. I'm like, no, you need to have calcium rich foods. The next point is vitamin D. Now, what is the big thing that vitamin D does to calcium? It majorly increases the absorption of calcium by 20 times. This means that much less calcium is going to end up in your kidneys and your urine. That's what vitamin D does. So a vitamin D deficiency could be another factor. So taking vitamin D, at least 10,000 IUs per day, could help reduce the formation of kidney stones as well as gout because you're going to form less calcium oxalates. And then another factor is citrates, okay, in like lemon juice. Lemon juice on a regular basis in your water would be very, very important because the more citrates you have, the less calcium oxalates will be formed. 
A lemon a day will go a long way, as well as lemon juice in your water. Now, in this article written in 1978, there is another interesting factor that I want to bring up that I think is very, very important. People tend to have more oxalates in their urine when they're B6 deficient. Yeah, B6. B6 naturally lowers the formation of oxalates. Here's the thing. B6 is in a lot of our foods. So it's apparently very difficult to become deficient. However, if you take B6 as a supplement in the form of pyridoxine, which is the most common you know, form that they put in supplements, you can actually create a deficiency of the active form of pyridoxine. Especially if you're prone to kidney stones or gout, I would recommend taking a different form, which you can find as a P5P form of B6. Now, another B vitamin that can help reduce the formation of oxalates is B1. The number one cause of a B1 deficiency is consuming too many refined carbohydrates. So this could also be wise people when they do refined carbs, they start hurting more in their big toe and they all of a sudden hurt more in their abdomen because their kidney stone is growing. So B6, B1, very important. Now, I already mentioned before moderate amount of protein because the data of this high protein connection to this problem is related to people consuming higher amounts of carbs at the same time. I have not found uh, any research on just high amounts of protein or a carnivore without these refined carbs. So kind of one of those factors that, you know, we don't really know for sure. But just so you know, the ketogenic diet is really a moderate amount of protein. It's not a high protein diet. And the next point is sodium. Increasing calcium in your urine, you lose more calcium if you have a lot of sodium. But again, I wouldn't worry about that as much because that's a minor point. But um, if you've tried everything and you still have problems with gout or kidney stones, maybe that massive amount of salt that you're consuming might need to be lowered or you might need to go up with the potassium to counter the effects of this high sodium. And that's probably more of the problem. It's not the sodium as much as the deficiency of potassium because potassium also can help reduce the formation of kidney stones and help to um, balance the pH in this acidic issue with gout. And then the last point is, like I said before, start consuming foods low in oxalates, okay? So as far as the nuts, I've already mentioned that. I will put a list down below. And then you have seeds also that are lower in oxalates, like pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds. Now, since we're on the topic of oxalates, uh, it's important for you to have all the information. So if you haven't seen this video on oxalates, I put it up right here. Check it out.